Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first in our new series of Sussex Development Lectures, run jointly between IDS, the Institute of Development Studies, and the University of Sussex's School of Global Studies, Centre for International Education, and SPRU. I'm Peter Taylor, I'm Director of Research at IDS, and I'm really delighted uh, to be launching this new series of Sussex Development Lectures. On this term, we're exploring the theme of development in an uncertain world. So from COVID-19 to climate change, economic shocks and technological disruptions, I think we've probably never been more aware that we're all living in a highly interconnected and increasingly uncertain world. Wherever we are in the world, we probably have all felt the impact of the pandemic and we continue to do so. We're also appreciating increasingly the interconnectedness between us all and the wide array of factors that influence all of our lives. Also, we're strongly aware that due to deep structural inequities and inequalities, those who are most at risk of being left behind before the pandemic are at even greater risk of being further excluded and marginalized due to its impact, all of which creates greater uncertainty about present, short-term and longer-term futures. So in this Sussex Development Lecture Series, we're convening speakers to share their diverse perspectives to examine our current era of uncertainty. We're asking them to respond to questions like, how do we conceptualize uncertainty and its relationship with its sustainable and inclusive development processes? What are the implications for research and action, particularly in terms of learning from and with those who live with and from uncertainty day to day and who are best placed to innovate and help refashion development more broadly? And what are the implications for valuing diverse kinds of knowledge and tackling increasingly entrenched inequities globally? So today, for our first session launching the series, we're delighted to have Professor Ian Schoons of IDS as our first speaker, speaking on why embracing uncertainty means rethinking development. Ian is a professor at IDS and co-director of the STEP Centre, which, which has done a substantial amount of work on uncertainty, looking at what kinds of uncertainty are there, why do they matter for sustainability, and what ideas, approaches and methods can help us to respond to them. He's also the co-editor of the open access book, The Politics of Uncertainty, Challenges of Transformation, which explores the politics of uncertainty in different areas, from finance and banking to critical infrastructures, as well as climate change, infectious disease responses, and natural disasters. His lecture today draws from the Pastoras program, which he'll talk about soon, with examples from pastoralism around the world, demonstrating the importance of learning from those who live with uncertainty day to day. So just before we get started, if you're on Twitter, I would encourage you to tweet about today's lecture using hashtag SussexDev, and we should have plenty of time for questions and answers. So please put any questions you'd like to ask in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And also just to let you know that the closed caption facility on Zoom is available for you to use. You can turn it on by selecting the CC option from the menu that, run, that runs along the bottom of the screen on Zoom. So without further ado, let's launch this series. And Ian, over to you. And I think you're going to talk to us for around 40 minutes, and then we'll be opening it up. And if you do have questions in the audience as we're going along, please put them uh, in the, ch the Q&A, and we'll be picking up once Ian has finished. Ian. Great. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for that introduction. Um, so in this talk, I want to make the argument that if we put uncertainty at the center of thinking and practices, this means a really fundamental rethinking of development as we know it. And I want to show that for a variety of reasons, we're stuck in a linear, mechanistic, technocratic mode, sometimes with extras added on, very often not, that fails to address the dynamic complexity of today's turbulent world. This, I want to argue, is problematic, but also sometimes dangerous. So my focus, as I've said, is on uncertainty, and indeed that's the, the theme of the whole lecture series, the unpredictable unknowns that confront us. As Helga Novotny described in her book, such uncertainties are written into the script of life whether in respect of climate change, finance systems, critical infrastructures, migration flows, or indeed epidemic or pandemic disease outbreaks, uncertainties continuously undermine the neat and simple ways policies and institutions are designed. But what if we live in a world 
that has so fundamentally changed that the institutions, policies, educational systems, and all our day-to-day -day approaches to living are no longer fit for purpose. What have we, what if we've experienced or maybe about to experience through climate change, for example, a radical shift in environments, economies, and political systems? What if the world is dominated by uncertainty and complexity, not risk and stability? What if the approaches we're taught that are so-called good development, planning, risk management, control systems, and so on, just no longer work? I'm going to argue that this is the case. We're experiencing the liquid modernity that Bauman talks of. This means we have to radically rethink development thinking and practice. But I'm also going to argue that all is not lost, that there are some people who have long grappled with uncertainty that we can learn from. These are the reliability professionals who by necessity must operate across domains. And this includes pastoralists, livestock keepers across the world, and learning from those who live with and from uncertainty, often operating hidden from view and living at the margins means, I will argue, a very different approach to development. So what do we mean by uncertainty? Or drawing from my colleague at SPRU, also co-director of the STEP Centre, Andy Sterling, the more encompassing term, incertitude. We can identify four dimensions. And let me illustrate with a case from a pastoral area, in this case, Isiolo in Northern Kenya. First risk, where the probabilities of both outcomes and their likelihoods are known or are deemed relatively unproblematic. This is what one might call the engineering approach. For example, when we build a road. Importantly, risk is contrasted with uncertainty, where likelihoods are unknown, such as in the case of drought. Despite improvements in climate forecasting, we don't know when or where droughts will strike and with what impacts. Rarely talked about is the form of incertitude arising from ambiguities, where outcomes are contested. For example, an area could be used for pastoral production of camels, for wildlife conservation and tourism, or for infrastructure development, all of which are happening in Isiolo. Here, questions of fairness, of justice, of distribution, who wins and who loses, whose values count, come to the fore. And finally, we have the condition of ignorance, where, in the words of former US Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, there are unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know we don't know. And as he knew all too well, you're extremely exposed when things are indeterminate. And expanding knowledge, especially when the, there are incommensurable perspectives, may actually only increase ignorance. So conditions of uncertainty, ambiguity, and indeed ignorance are by far the most common situations we can encounter in development practice and policy. They're not amenable to simple risk management, the top left-hand corner of this diagram. We need other approaches to both understanding the world and responding to uncertainty, not normally in our conventional development toolbox. Let me illustrate. In conventional approaches to development, policies, institutions, and practices tend to close down to risk, this top left-hand corner. This is conditioned by politics and power, what Foucault would have called governmentality. The examples on this slide are from pastoral de development, but you could choose any other area. Just think about the areas you work in. Plans, models, insurance products, goals, targets, metrics, indicators, seek closure, pushing us dangerously into zones where knowledge and outcomes are assumed to be known, or at least thought to be able to be estimated, predicted, or calculated. Let me offer another example. There's much excitement these days about technology-led approaches to climate adaptation in pastoral areas. Mobile phones with climate predictions and insurance products linked to index-based payouts. By definition, these define outcomes in terms of predicted probabilities based on climate models and liability assessments. 
It would be fine if the predictions were accurate, but inevitably they're not because of the uncertainties. And as a result, relying on a removed market-based system may, some argue, actually increase vulnerability and in, in the process undermine local, re, local responses attuned to uncertainties. But where do these professional practices and institutional styles that focus on risk management and control in development come from? Are they always necessary? Are there other systems of thought and visions that offer a different perspective? I argue that we need to dig a bit deeper in order to gain a more historical perspective into how framings of development have emerged, particularly in the West. So, Many see the project of so-called development as starting with Harry Truman's speech of 1945. Development was this big state-led normative aspiration for change after the Second World War about planning and reconstruction. It of course later took on a, a neoliberal turn, transformed into the Washington Consensus as the focus shifted from states to markets to del deliver progress, but it was firmly a modernizing vision where the objective was a particular version of planned progress, overcoming risks, controlling the unruly. But as Cowan and Shenton in the book Doctrines of Development, published now quite a long time ago, suggest, we need to engage with a deeper history of development. In the 18th and 19th century, there was much debate about what development was or modernity and progress in the West. For example, in the early 1800s, Auguste Comte's ideas were rooted in an understanding of the world as cycles of change, of growth and destruction, and ideas of collective trusteeship. And it was only later in the 1800, later 1800s and the early 1900s coinciding with ideas of Darwinian evolution and the, and the growth of the Industrial Revolution in, the nor in Northern Europe, that a linear, individualized set of ideas of progress towards a particular type of modernity began to take over. This canon of thought, of course, influenced development studies. For example, through Rostow's ideas of stages towards development, from underdeveloped to developed, from third world so-called to first world and so on. These set of ideas of modernity and progress as a linear move have framed our views of development ever since. The result is blueprint plans, control, management of risk. Just look at the practices of any development agency you choose to name. Yes, there's participation and gender empowerment and so on sprinkled on, but what are the assumptions underneath? Now, this framing of development that I suggest is the dominant one needn't be so. As I've already argued, there are older traditions in Western thought, such as Auguste Comte that I've mentioned, but also many others. But perhaps more importantly, this framing of development from the, largely from the West, West, which was very much part of the colonial project, of course, too, is confronted and challenged by other ideas from non-Western traditions of thought, whether from Africa or Asia or Latin America, where ideas of cyclicity, renewal, impermanence, and yes, uncertainty are central. Given the dominance of Western framings, these have too often been subdued or eliminated through colonialism and the post-colonial project of Western development. And as the world grapples with unprecedented turbulence and diverse uncertainties, it's important to seek out alternative inspirations and actively resurface and reclaim perhaps some of these ideas. But even within the canons of Western thinking, it's not as if uncertainty has not been central to some important debates. Here are three quotes from Nobel Prize winning and much celebrated scientists and economists, but writing, importantly, 50 to 100 years ago. Unfortunately, today, after the technocratic planning vision of development took over, especially from the 1960s, and as disciplines increasingly narrowed, such perspectives where uncertainty is central have often been lost in research, but also perhaps more importantly in teaching. Look at the standard textbooks on economics and development, for example, there's barely a single mention of uncertainty. 
No admission that calculative practices, models, standard formulaic plans cannot solve complex and uncertain challenges. So, given the prevalence of uncertain conditions in today's world and the failure of policies and institutions to address this, this, I'd say, is a big problem for the project of development. And it's, of course, a large reason why so-called development often fails. Yet, across fields, despite these mainstream views, there is the beginning of a realization that this actually matters, a bubbling up of alternative perspectives often by necessity as people confront uncertain conditions and realize that standard ways of doing things just don't work. I wanna give three quick examples in different ways. I think these can help rethink and reshape our conceptions of development. First, finance and banking. The 2008 financial crash has pro provoked some really important reflection, I think, in finance and economics more broadly, including in some of the books on the right-hand side of this slide. The former chief economist of the Bank of England, Andy Haldane, reflected on why the conventional approach uh, to financial regulation, highlighted in the middle column of this slide, including voluntary forms of regulation, individualized accountability, just didn't work in the face of uncertainty. And really, in a really excellent paper called Rethinking the Financial Network, he argued, processes of securitization resulted in the network becoming complex, dense, and opaque, with diversification generating heightened system-wide uncertainties. The result, of course, was the crash. And he argues the crisis was rooted in what he called within the banking system, an exaggerated sense of knowledge and control. He and others argue that new forms of financial regulation are required that increase the transparency and collective accountability that accept and acknowledge uncertainties. And this means focusing in particular on the cultures and practices of key actors within market sec settings. The basic conclusion is that markets and so, so banking and finance systems are constructed through social relations, of course. And these matter even when transactions are occurring in nanoseconds over globally connected networks. Now, does this appear in economic textbooks? By and large, no. Is this central to the manuals for good practice for banking? Almost certainly not. Such insights, I think, are really important, as I'll discuss in a bit, in rethinking how we go about uh, market development more broadly. Now, my second example is a very different one in thinking about, on, thinking about around uncertainty emerging for work on critical infrastructures, for example, energy and water supply systems and so on. How to generate reliable supplies, of key services, in the face of uncertainty. Again, we see two broad responses. In the middle of the slide, one, a standard control oriented engineering approach based very much on a technical managerial response to risk. Remember that diagram from earlier on, closing down to risk in the top left corner. This is the standard approach. But second is what Emery Rowe and colleagues call a mess and reliability approach. And this is very different. Observing professionals in such systems as they have done, where failure is unacceptable, reliability is generated through a proactive intervention, tracking between micro level practices and macro pattern in these control rooms, navigating away from zones of ignorance and danger. Reliability professionals, therefore, are the control oper room operators, the scientists, the engineers, the IT professionals, the suppliers, the regulators, and others who keep the system running and reliable. Many of the responses that, they, that are seen among such professionals are unacknowledged, informal, below the radar practices, using tacit experiential knowledge, case studies, scenario analysis, pattern rec recognition skills. 
It is this professionalism, not control-based engineering, that makes the system reliable, Emery and others argue. Recognizing reliability professionals in these type of settings and others, as I'll argue, and providing training in and support for such practices is essential. This is important, as we'll see in a minute, in pastoral systems too, but it's as relevant in any development setting where we're trying to deliver services, say social assistance or whatever, in contexts of uncertainty. For example, when there is a conflict, where crises and disasters strike and so on. In other words, many of the contexts that so-called development tries to operate in. Now, my third example is around addressing infectious disease outbreaks. Here in the picture, pictures of, of Ebola outbreaks, but the COVID-19 pandemic is a very good example too. Again, of course, simplifying, there are two contrasting perspectives on what to do. The conventional approach, again in the middle of the slide, is focusing on risk management, using predictive models to generate early warnings, leading to medicalized and securitized responses. Such technocratic responses centered on risk management techniques and the whole array of expert-led practices associated with early warning assessments, emergency preparedness, contingency planning, and so on, are justified as part of a crisis narrative, which obscures the complexities and uncertainties on the ground. Yet the experience of COVID-19 over the past two years, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2016, avian influenza in Southeast Asia before, has shown that such top-down risk-based approaches often do not work. Indeed, the UK parliamentary inquiry into the COVID responses the response in the UK that came out this week highlighted just this, the danger of groupthink, narrow disciplinary ex expertise, over-reliance on models, lack of uh, structured challenge uh, around uncertainties. So if responses don't deal with uncertainties at play and the social relations, cultural logics and community interactions at the center of disease outbreaks, spread and responses, they fail as they did so tragically in the UK. Reflecting on the West African Ebola experience, Paul Richards, an anthropologist, observes common sense, improvisation, distributed practical knowledge, and collective action are invaluable elements in a people's science of infection control. Again, this is an argument for the importance of real-time responses to uncertainty and moving away from the managerial control-based approaches. But sadly, we're very far from this in the standard development responses to pandemics, just as other emergency or disaster responses. So these re three cases, and I could add many more, are showing the limits of a risk-based control orientated response. And in a recent edited and open access book that Peter mentioned at the beginning from the Step Center, we reflected on uncertainty from a multiple different angles, including these three, but also in relation to the debates about security, about technology regulation, about insurance, migration, cities development, religion, and much more. And in the process, we identified five interacting ways uncertainties emerge through indeterminate knowledge, which we've talked about, through the material properties of systems and their complexities, which we've also talked about, through people's experiences, through feelings and their feelings and emotions, through how uncertainties impinge on people's bodies very directly, and through day-to-day -day practices. And across all the examples explored in the different chapters of the book, we identify important implications for politics, how uncertainties can be both sources of, of emancipation, of opening up, but also of closure and authoritarian control. And they also, and uncertainties also have implications for accountability. And so questions of epistemic justice and the role of expertise and authority, who's in charge, who is responsible. And through this, ultimately, the implications for transformation and the politics of transformation or the politics of development, which I'll come to towards the end of the talk. 
So all this means rejecting the standard control oriented approach that we've talked about, and so requires a much more fundamental reappraising of what we mean by modernity and progress and so development. So there's an urgent need, I'd argue, to learn about how to do things better, how to respond to uncertainty more effectively. Yes, we can learn from the bankers, from those in the control rooms, from frontline health professionals that we've talked about in the examples I've just given. But I want to also make the case that perhaps the best source of learning comes from those who for millennia have lived with and from uncertainty, and not just those who are scrambling to adjust in the face of turbulent change. So you ask, well, what on earth could be the connection between thinking about financial derivatives, air traffic control infrastructure, hurricane disasters, pandemic responses, and as in this picture, camels in Northern Kenya? Well, making the connections between pastoralists, lived experiences, and other domains of where uncertainty is central is at the core of the European Research Council funded project that I lead, Pastres, and indeed connects back to work over many years on pastoralism and development at IDS. I want to share some of this emerging thinking with you in order to link the two parts of the talk and to come back at the end to how we have to th rethink development under conditions of uncertainty. Pastress fieldwork is led by six PhD students and is working across six sites in Amdo, Tibet in China, in Western India, in Gujarat in Southern Ethiopia, in Isiolo in Kenya, in Southern Tunisia and in Sardinia in Italy. And we've been exploring together how pastoralists respond to diverse uncertainties. Can these insights offer lessons more broadly for how to confront an uncertain world? And if you're studying at IDS, you can find out more about the work in the exhibition in the reception area of the IDS building right now, or via our website of the exhibition, seeingpastoralism.org. Now, pastoralism is centrally about living with and from uncertainty, making use of variability as a productive resource. Contrast this with the green revolution model of ag agriculture, fixed, stable, controlled, so often promoted as part of the ideal trajectory of development. Pastoralists must make use of extensive rangelands, which make up over half the world's land surface across every continent outside Antarctica. Such rangelands are highly variable, so-called non-equilibrium resources. It's a production system where variability is valued, not ignored or controlled, as conventional agricultural development proposes. Living with and from uncertainty has other consequences too, each, I think, with major implications for the way we think about core themes of development. Let me explain, drawing on some of our work with pastoralists across the world. First, in relation to markets, as Julia Simula is finding in Sardinia, markets for sheep milk to produce cheese, the famous Pecorino Romano predominantly, don't exist in standard textbook forms. They're part of networks. They're nested and formal, informal and formal markets inter intersect. These are what we call real markets where uncertainty prevails and all pastoralists must negotiate this continuously. Just as in within the financial markets discussed earlier, they are social, political, culturally embedded, embedded in relations. Therefore, responding to uncertainty requires a much more sophisticated approach to market development than thinking just about I don't know, demand and supply, price setting, the standard approaches to value chain development, for example. Now, in, la in relation to land and natural resources, as Pal Sereng is finding out in Amdo, Tibet, land control arrangements and property rights don't follow standard models of private, common, or state property, but are much more flexible, negotiated, and hybrid assemblages. They have to be because of uncertainty, necessarily. So they have, pastoralists have to confront diverse uncertainties whether that's variable climatic conditions or land grabs by external actors. 
reliability in the face of uncertainty, just as with the critical infrastructures discussed before, is generated through social relations and investing in institutions. This requires shared knowledge of system change and policy, as well as an understanding, an intimate understanding of immediate conditions. Land governance or tenure reform, for example, a favorite focus for development um, activities, thus must take this seriously as plans will inevitably unravel, as they indeed often do, if standard models of property rights, land tenure and land control are imposed. In East Africa, Masresha Tay and Tahira Mohamed have been exploring how Baran pastoralists in southern Ethiopia and northern Kenya, respectively, respond to livelihood shocks, especially drought, but also conflict, locust swarms, disease, and so on, often in combination. They're asking, do standardized approaches to livestock insurance or social protection assistance designed to respond to specified anticipated risks and targeted in well-defined ways responding to bureaucratic designs work effectively under such conditions of uncertainty? The short answer is no. And a wider perspective that links such standard development in interventions, the bread and butter of social protection and li livelihood interventions across the world, to the wider set of practices that people have to deal with uncertainties, not just risks. This means attentions to informal moral economies is required. And this also implies a move away from individual targeted transfers to more social, mutual approaches where care and collectivity are essential. Now, mobility, another theme, is a key response to, under, un, to uncertainty by pastoralists across the world, as you'll know. And as Natasha Maru has been finding in Gujarat in Western India, Movement is crucial for Rabari pastoralists as they seek out resources for that, their animals across the seasons. But it's not just a simple movement along a fixed tra trajectory. It's paced, linked to local rhythms, always tied to people's own experiences of and effective responses to uncertainty. Again, a caring, convivial relationship is important among pastoralists and between pastoralists and their hosts, such as farmers, involving social and political negotiations. In our increasingly mobile, globalized world, where mobility is vital for so many people to gain their livelihoods, thinking about how mobilities happen should be really a central topic for development. Facilitating mobilities rather than controlling and restricting movements must be central if uncertainties are to be addressed. But where is this in our discussions? For sure, we can learn from pastoralists, not just about crossing frontiers, moving along corridors and creating safe passage, but thinking about mobility as central. Of course, this has big implications for thinking about migration, hot development topic, of course. Being mobile is important for, for the livestock owners in southern Tunisia, as Linda Papagallo has been finding, but in different ways. Migration to big cities, even abroad, is essential for maintaining livelihoods at home. Sustaining relationships through diverse institutions is vital for responding to the uncertainties of contemporary life. Rather than fixity and stability, liquid, mobile relations dominate. So-called development cannot happen in one place. And development efforts need to facilitate these movements, not restrict them, as is so often the case with migration policies around complex visa processes, border controls, managing uh, refugee flows, and so on. So, these examples from diverse pastoral settings, as well as from finance, banking, critical infrastructures, disease control, all suggest, I'd argue, new directions for development. <laughs>
whether this is around market development, service deliver delivery, disaster emergency responses, social protection, livelihoods de development, land and natural resource governance, or migration policy. Choose any area of development you work on and explore the radically different ways of thinking and practice that emerge if you really take uncertainty seriously. Making uncertainty central in the way pastoralists, trading floor bankers, control room reliability professionals, villagers and frontline workers tackling disease all must, therefore means rethinking development, conceptually and practically. And as I've said repeatedly, this means rejecting the risk-based, control-orientated, managerial, technocratic approaches, the top left-hand corner of our original matrix, constructed around a linear vision of modernity and progress that so often dominates development thinking and practice. And from the sort of research I've highlighted across very diverse fields, we're already getting hints about what an alternative vision might entail. So flexibility, mobility, network, sharing, mutuality, improvisation, experiment, practical knowledge, negotiation, transparency, horizontal accountability are just some of the watchwords. Now, of course, this argument isn't new. As I've argued before, there are much older traditions of Western thought, just as there are important strands of non-Western thinking that challenge a narrow vision of modernity and progress. And in more contemporary development literature, such as the books on this slide and many, many more, there are important critiques of mainstream development thinking and practice, which emphasize the importance of uncertainty and indeed contingency, conjuncture, adaptive change and so on, along with a sort of critique of the biases that emerge from an anti or post-political techno-modernist and colonized vision of development. But such critical perspectives on development don't necessarily feed into mainstream practice, as we know uh, from all our experience. So what does this mean then for rethinking development. Simplifying hugely, um, mainstream development thinking remains centered on what we call in the step center development as controlling transitions, the left-hand side of this slide. Managed, expert, top-down, and so on. This, as we've discussed, is a particular vision of modernist progress where controllable risk, not unpredictable uncertainty, dominates. Remember, this is the top left-hand corner, not the wider knowledge notions of incertitude that we've discussed. This is contrasted in this rather simplified diagram with what we call development as caring transformations. Here, uncertainty and indeed ambiguity and ignorance are central. It's more a political, contested, unruly process involving multiple plural knowledges and skills and where Diversity, flexibility, experiment, improvisation, the watchwords I talked about just now are all central. Such a perspective is not dominated by fear and force, as is so often the case. It's more a hopeful vision for development where principles of care, conviviality, collectivity, commoning are at the fore. Is therefore not mainstream development as we've come to know it, and what is mostly practiced and indeed often taught as development, although I hope not at IDS. It's of course actually draws on the sort of alternative intellectual traditions I mentioned before, and its stance on decolonizing the construction of development knowledge and practices links very directly to the practical tacit insights of pastoralists and others who must confront uncertainty and complexity every single day. So to, more, to move towards a conclusion, uncertainty is central to most people's lives and with the pandemic and the effect of climate, perhaps everyone, but particularly people living in 
poorer and more marginalized settings. Uncertainties are not equally distributed and not experienced in the same way. Inequality and uncertainty must be understood uh, in the same breath. But what, how do people think about uncertainty? A Tibetan herder from the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau, where this picture was taken, explained to me a few years back that the past is gone, the present is happening, but you can't know the future. That is, he said, uncertainty. So as we embrace uncertainty, just as herders and pastoralists across the world have to, as central, not something to be wished away, I've argued, hopefully convincingly, that this suggests a very different, rather more humble, but the nevertheless hopeful pers perspective on a, a different vision of progress and modernity. And so a very different framing of these keywords of, of development, of innovation, of sustainability, and indeed uh, development itself. So when in your classes at IDS or elsewhere, you hear of managing risk, plans to control, to create stability, to focus on targets, to nurture technological fixes or market solutions of transfers or fixed settlements, then think again, question the assumptions of where these are coming from. These are assumptions of a lifetime. Yours and my whole educational career, indeed the whole history of liberal Western modernity, at least since the late 19th century, and of the project of so-called development as constructed after 1945. You have to ask, is this an old, outdated world being talked about? One that is fast disappearing and irrelevant. And are these ideas relevant today and especially tomorrow? What then comes in their place? How do we reimagine development? And to my mind, thinking about uncertainty is the biggest challenge for development today. Thank you very much. I'll stop there with a few websites. Great, Ian. Thank you very much indeed. A challenging and provocative opening session for us. And I know there's a lot of material behind this, published work, open access, uh, the websites that you've just put up there uh, are sources that uh, everyone on this call can, can go to. And uh, I know they are attracting a lot of attention and a lot of debate around these issues as well. So thanks so much. This is a really great start to the, the series. And now we have a chance to open it up for questions, comments, ideas. We've got a couple of questions in the chat, in the, in the Q&A already, which is good. And I think they're both really interesting questions. Just before we get into those, I, I just wanted to ask you one question, because I think, um, I think you know, what, you're, what you've brought over the last 40 minutes reflects really a wide array of conversations which are going on at IDS. And we also know in many other circles as well. And it's quite an uncomfortable conversation because um, I think there's a certain amount of fear and anxiety that comes with it. People who spent their whole lives setting up organizations, institutions, frameworks to try to find more certain ways of addressing problems and achieving solutions, per perhaps, have, you know, one manifestation of that, the SDGs, 17 goals, 169 targets, 232 indicators, a lot of emphasis on measurement, on metrics. But it's also about mobilization. It's about collectivity. It's about trying to catalyze and bring people together for, uh, for action for a different world. What's your take on how, you know, the, the experience and reflections you have around uncertainty connect with a global framework for action like the SDGs? Are they compatible? Do you see them as sort of, is there a nesting or an overlap? What's your take on that? Okay, this was, this was the subject of the uh, Sussex Development Lecture I did a few years ago, I think, um, on, uh, on rethinking the SDGs. I mean, I think the, the, the problem with the SDGs as they've emerged are exactly around that 
problem of the, the audit culture that has got laid upon them. And this is a consequence of the type of organizations, UN being a prime example, but government organizations and others that require for their day-to-day -day working this paraphernalia of metrics and indicators and the rest. But actually the SDGs potentially have a more radical potential in my view, partly because they cover such a broad range and partly because they can um, provide the basis for this type of negotiation. You know, it's not sectoral, it is cross-sectoral. It's not just technical, it's also political. You know, the, the, the questions of justice and inequality are right there in amongst technical solutions to dealing with, with water crises. So in my view, opening up the SDGs much more to that conversation across, across the SDGs, not letting them being siloed, as, was, uh, as has often had, you know, which SDG is yours? Oh, mine's number one, yours is number seven, right? We're all going to campaign for money for that. That, that to, to my mind, misses the point completely. The SDGs could be a framework for an open discussion in the context of uncertainty and turbulence about the future of uh, global development. Currently, they're stuck in this type of narrow audit culture, top left-hand corner, um, uh, that institutions and the governmentality of those institutions and the fears and favors that exist within the professionals within those institutions who don't know how to operate differently when the UN is divided sectorally, um, despite all the call calls for the one UN. Um, so yeah, we do have to challenge the way we think about it, but I don't think all is lost with the SDGs in particular. Um, and in many institutions, yes, people do fear being more open to the uncertainties that are out there. But actually, there's often a mismatch between the bureaucratic design and the procedures that exist within organizations, development organizations, and what actually happens on the ground. Many development agencies have to operate in these settings, you know, responding to uh, you know, a hurricane or a, an earthquake or to a, a drought or famine or whatever necessarily the people on the ground are having to be these reliability professionals. They're learning that capacity to, and have to, have to, um, have to develop those, those capacities, but we often don't recognize them. They're often penalized often for erring from the plan, whereas actually the plan will fail unless they do what they do. So there's a sort of mismatch in a lot of organizations between the top-down structured risk management control, which is the history in, of how those organizations emerge, and the actual practice on the ground. Um, sometimes I think IDS and other organizations like universities are very similar. Great. <laughs> Again, I love this combination of um, challenge, hope, and provocation all blended together, which is probably at the heart of what uncertainty is all about. Yeah. We've got a number of questions flooding in now, which is great. So I'm going to give you a couple to start with. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, one of the conversations we've been having at uh, IDS recently is we're framing it around sort of development in our own backyard, thinking about the UK universal issues, how they're playing out really on our doorstep. So one of our listeners has asked, the recent gas crisis, where gas prices hit extreme lows during lockdowns, and now reaching worrying highs as we come into winter. Was this predictable? And, and how do we get politicians to act in advance of similar crises, being more proactive and not reactive? I guess, how, how do they think about it, you know, through an uncertainty way of um, responding to that? And then another question, a bit related, there's been talk of the UK being behind other countries in modernizing and rebooting infrastructure. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about green and resilient housing, water systems in urban areas, etc. But why is there no base to push for this, even though the ambiguity is less regarding the outcomes? So why are we not seeing a kind of more people, whether it's politicians or other stakeholders, getting together behind um, this way of thinking and acting? 
Okay, two very good questions, two quite different questions, but um, in answer to the gas crisis question, I don't know the details. Um, could it have been predicted? Maybe elements of it could have been, but I think when, when you are going to have to, to deal with high variability in the inputs into a system, this is you know, a classic case of where reliability and understanding mess and complexity is essential. Now, in a privatized utility system that we have in the UK without much central knowledge and so on, you can get very quickly, just as happened in the banking crisis, these ripple effects of, uh, of uncertainties that run through the system. So I think, you know, while maybe the two, you know, some people claim they predicted the 2008 crash, not that many people, otherwise something might have been done with it. Um, some people may have predicted the gas crisis, um, but actually what you have to do, and you've, you've hinted at in, your, in the question, um, is be proactive, be prepared, understand the system, have your reliability professionals in there, get, you know, get used to mess, get used to complexity. We're gonna have to deal with it always. And gas delivery systems are just as the same as delivering social assistance to drought uh, affected peoples in Africa are going to have to re reboot, re-equip and retrain their, the people who are dealing with this, because otherwise we end up being reactive and, you know, emergency responses, whether about gas in Britain or droughts or disaster responses in Africa are tend to be reactive, not proactive. So, I mean, that's a sort of partial answer to that, but I think there's a, you know, there's a, there's a big task in there to think about, well, what are, the, what are the primary skills of these reliability professionals? I talked about Emery Rowe's work with control op room operators, which is about keeping the lights on in California. Um, but you know what are what are the what's the skill base of these middle level professionals who understand complex systems but also are very rooted in the in the ground you know on the ground. I, I don't think we're necessarily training those sort of people, and probably in development we need to train more of them. Uh, it's not just about participation. It's not just about understanding macro policy. It's about the re relationships between the two and the mediation between the two. Um, and I think very often we, we fail to do that. And we've, we've made this case in, re, in respect of sustainability more broadly, but I think it's, it's, it's relevant to any context where, where um, uncertainties are there. The question about uh, you know, the push for green transformations in the UK, I mean, that's a big and, and to some extent different topic about the politics of, of, of green transformation and where the, where the constituencies are. Um, I mean, you know, there's, th this is a, an example of where uncertainties can be used to close down debate. You know, the argument from, you know, the state could be, well, we don't know what, you know, uh, you know, low carbon alternatives in housing or infrastructure development are, and therefore we must do some more research and therefore we just delay. So there is, a, there is this dangerous tension where uncertainty enters a political debate that it can close down and be used by regressive characters, car uh, regressive actors in order to, to, uh, suggests that actually nothing can be done. As Peter hinted, I have a much more hopeful open view about uncertainty that it can open up debate, that it should be the focus for a more em emancipatory, hopeful vision that allows people to enter into that. So let's discuss about rebooting infrastructure. Let's think about alternative water systems. Um, and that's where you know, citizen engagement with these what are often closed scientific debates becomes really important. I think that was just as re relevant in the, the pandemic as it, as it is in this, these wider questions of, of green transformations. Great, thanks. Um, so a question from James now, which is which an, I think an interesting one. I'm actually looking forward to your response on this. He's, he's saying that 
Um, it's interested to know about how this is about the world change. Have we not always needed to embrace complexity and uncertainty? Was the world ever any less uncertain? So he understands the challenge, but is it a new challenge? In many respects, not. I mean, my argument is that you know, pastoralists for millennia have addressed uncertainty. Highly variable rangelands, highly variable rainfall has always been part and parcel of, of how they've managed and coped. Uh, this is why we can learn from pastoralists and others who have uh, continuously engaged with complexity and uncertainty. My argument, though, is that, as it were, the traditions of modernity, as I've called it, a particular version of development, have closed down the capacity to think about that. And that now we have a mismatch between the institutions, policies, educational regimes, training capacities that people have been trained on the assumption of a stable and controlled world. And that's the problem we face now. Pastoralists don't face it. They've always, you know, that's what they do. I mean, they're facing new forms of uncertainty. I mean, you know, the pastoralists of northern Kenya this last year have faced, you know, a human pandemic, a flock, a, a, a swarms of locusts, flood and drought, as well as the normal conflicts and so on. These are a whole array of different uncertainties that they, they confront. But I'm arguing that there are systemic challenge, challenges of the way that we've locked down into the top left-hand box, as I keep pointing to, of a sort of risk, control, stability vision in our institutions and in, more broadly, the project of development. And that mismatch between uncertainties, which continue to exist, and, you know, and whether they've accelerated or not, is less the point than the, than the mismatch that we're confronting. Now, there are certain uncertainties that we are confronting more of. Climate change is the most obvious one, where even if, if rainfall patterns don't change massively over time, the, the variations do. The IPCC report that came out in August very clearly demonstrates that without any shadow of doubt. But, you know, what Andy Haldane was talking about in the banking system is that the sort of aggregation of, of institutional complexity within the basic financial system creates these new forms of uncertainty that exist at a systemic level, which we didn't have before, you know, when we used other forms of currency and we didn't have, you know, complex globalized banking systems. And that may be equally the case in, in, you know, energy supply. We were talking about gas earlier on. I know nothing about gas, but I suspect the gas systems and energy supply systems are more complex and therefore uh, more uncertain. But it's, the, it, to my mind, it's the mismatch between our rigidified, stabilized view of controlled risk and the world out there that mismatch has become more and more apparent and more and more challenging and more and more dangerous. And the pandemic, I think, showed that big time. And it was very interesting that the parliament, I mentioned it in the talk, the parliamentary report that came out this week highlighted this mismatch between the way science advice and policy processes operated in the UK and it could be replicated in other contexts, but the UK, it was, it was very extreme, um, meant that we just were, we, we did not deal with a complex, uncertain, unfolding pandemic very well. We really did not. A lot of people died and it had consequences. Um, and this happens again and again, whether it's in disaster relief or in social assistance programs, migration policy, natural resource policy, market development, again and again and again, we see failures of development because of this mismatch. Yeah, I think it is very tempting though, I think, isn't it, to um, try to inject uh, an aura of certainty into pronouncements, especially if you're a politician, because um, in a country like the UK, relatively speaking for a number of decades, people have lived with a, a certain amount of certainty with some blips for sure. But compared with those groups, the more on the margins that you've, um, you know, you, you've highlighted, which we'll come back to in a moment with some more questions. Um, but it, it, is, it is interesting to see how challenging it seems to be for, for those in, with political power to admit that they don't really know everything. Um, and that that actually sometimes is the better answer than suggesting uh, certitudes 
which are not a, a representation of um, you know what may be the most desirable way to to move forward you can see absolutely i could i couldn't agree more i couldn't agree more yeah okay back to the pastoralist context alex uh, says thanks for the inspiring vision of how development could be reimagined from the pastoralist territories in the margins but surely these pastoralist territories are disappearing because of unequal power relations that makes it impossible for pastoralists to protect them against enclosure and predation. So are you and the pastoralist team learning anything about how pastoralists can build collective power to protect the geographical and political space that they need to be able to continue living successfully with uncertainty? It's a very good question, Alex. Um... And yes, indeed, this is the case. Patterns of enclosure, um, expropriation of land and resources are happening uh, in marginal pastoral areas right across the world. And this is, is affecting you know, the latitude within which pastoralists can respond to, to uncertainties. And uh, you know, we are indeed learning about you know, forms of collective action and political action of how pastoralists are negotiating this incredibly, as you say, unequal political terrain. But they are approaching this from, you know, big disadvantage as, you know, of, of it very often marginalized within states, uh, unable to articulate political voice, uh, not necessarily effective, effectively allied with um, settled populations, agriculturalists, and very often poorly organized in terms of, of, of this sort of collective action that you talk about. So the, the forms of action that we see um, to, some ex to, to some degree are about the, the type of you know, collective action that you're talking about. But very often it's the more, you know, what J Jim Scott would call weapons of the week, the sort of hidden transcripts, the, the subversive ways that people are managing and negotiating uh, state power and forms of enclosure and predation. Um, so we see this in, in all our sites, um, but uh, Paldan Sereng is, is particularly looking at us in, in, in China, in, on the Tibetan Plateau, where huge infrastructural product projects are unfolding. And of course, pastoralists are being affected by these, but have to negotiate and create new ways of dealing with normal uncertainties, if I can put it that way, but also uh, new forms of uncertainty generated by these type of projects. But it's this latitude and this ability and this, this ability to improvise and negotiate. And I don't want to, to romanticize it too much because yeah brute political power can exclude completely but actually these capacities often are the route through which to through which people can negotiate their way but there are limits and you're right absolutely to point that out okay, great um now a couple of, i'll give you a couple of questions now which they're not directly related, but one might speak to the other. Uh, Guy Sharrick said, thanks for a great talk. Have you seen examples in non-pastoralist systems of the reimagined vision that you've presented? And then uh, we have another question, which actually I think speaks to one of the points you raised, the examples you raised in your talk about migration. Um, there seem to be more people in refugee camps now than ever before, living daily in a state of uncertainty. What will happen for them and when? Is this an example where uncertainty might create delay? And surely it's a demographic ticking time problem. So um, two somewhat different questions, but one might spark a response to the other. I'm not sure they're related, but I will have a go at both. And there's a nice one on interdisciplinary perspectives that I might have a go at too. Yeah, I was, well, you're going to come on that. to that. Oh, you're saving that one. Okay. Okay. So in relation to Guy's question, yeah, I think there are lots of examples. And the reason that I constructed the talk to include um, not only sort of demonstrating from our work what pastoralists do, but also talk about bankers and people in control rooms in electricity power stations in California and 
health professionals working in, in pandemic settings in the UK and elsewhere, was to demonstrate that this isn't just a, you know, these aren't just a set of skills and capacities that exist sort of out there far away. I mean, I'm arguing that you can, we can learn from the margins and that pastoralists probably are some of the best people we can learn from. But we can also learn from, you know, people in, in, in these other settings. Now, I mean, having a conversation between bankers and pastoralists may be difficult to convene, but it might be quite an interesting one to convene around these sort of debates. What will be different, though, is that the bankers, would be my guess, will not be able to articulate or reflect on their practices in such a clear way. Because the bankers that Andy Haldane was talking about in the, and many others who've studied the crash were often you know, struggling to deal with, with unfolding context in a way that was you know, really, really challenging in the moment. And it's only others who've come in to reflect on what actually happened um, that these, you know, these practices of you know, cultural exchange and sort of essentially community knowledge and sharing and experiment and so on, happening in a very different way and different setting, uh, were also relevant uh, to, their, to, to their own experience. Because they weren't trained to do this. This arrived on them. They were trained to keep this stable. They were trained to keep this controlled. And when it got out of hand, they had to improvise. Whereas pastoralists are not, you know, they don't have the sense that they can be constrained and controlled because uncertainty is, is what they live from and live with. But, you know, if you're also talking about non-pastoralists in other as it were, agricultural or other settings, yes, there are lots. I mean, you know, work on Sweden agriculture is very similar themes. Work on people who live, live in deltas. I went to an absolutely fascinating conference earlier this year of a group who've been studying delta living, you know, where waters come up and down. Um, uh, exactly the same set of stories. So I think there are many, many people and probably more of us than you think um, are having to confront these type of things, these type of conditions and to develop capacities in this type of way. So I think we have to, you know, even thinking about ourselves, how have we coped through this pandemic? Um, I think a lot of us have, have learned some of these skills, I mean, with difficulty, because it's been challenging. And Peter talked about fear and anxiety. Yes, this can be the, the consequence, the consequence, but the pandemic, I think, perhaps has, has taught, us, um, taught, taught us a few things. Now, in terms of the whole debate about migration and refugee, questions this is not my area of expertise by any means but for for sure people uh, migrating and living in refugee camp, camps or or in in you know in processes of movement um, between states are living as you say in a daily state of uncertainty uncertainties in you know day-to-day -day livelihoods but also uncertainties around their status around uh, have, having or not having statehood and so on and so forth. And I think with an increasing number of people moving, necessarily moving for livelihoods, um, then we have to think about migration and movement and mobility, as I suggested, in a much more open way. I mean, the, the, the standard way of thinking about migration from the big you know, contracts, uh, the big sort of migration agreements that d define migration policy globally and refugee policy indeed, is safe, reliable um, movement. That's fine. But what does safe, reliable movement often mean in policies? It means, you know, safer processing at borders. It means visas. It means you know, it means all sorts of things that constrain people's actually actually constrain, especially poor and marginalized peoples, a people ability people's ability to move. So, you know, safe and reliable, fine. Safety, obviously, that's not disputable, but the, the whole um, implication of stable, safe, 
reliable migration, which is the aim, you know, for example, of European um, migration policy, um, ends up putting up borders, ends up, uh, you know, actually restricting migration, particularly for those who don't have um, have uh, you know access to resources and so on. So. I think we have to think about mobility and migration in very different ways when we're thinking about the contemporary setting of, as I mentioned, what Bauman calls liquid modernities, where mobility, network mobility um, is part and parcel of what we do and how we have to live for all of us, uh, not just refugees, but obviously refugees ending up in camps because they're trying to move. Um, you know, is obviously a failure of our ability collectively, globally, to think about migration and mobility in a more, a more productive way. I'm sorry, that's not a particularly good answer, but I think there's, there's something in there that uh, needs more debate. So thank you for raising it, anonymous yeah. attendee. Yeah. And, and I haven't forgotten the question about advising the scholar with interdisciplinary interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But there is, there is now, a, I think, a related question from Dina Zayed, uh, just on what you've just been saying. So maybe we'll just take oh, that. Oh, good. We'll come uh, back let me that. just come back. Yeah. Um, so, um, Dina's saying that, um, excellent talk and thanks. Um, is there a risk of romanticizing uncertainty? And she was particularly struck by the comment made on refugees and curious to hear about how embracing uncertainty could also become a weapon for the powerful to deepen the precarity of those who are most vulnerable. Dean, absolutely. And that's what I was saying earlier on, that uncertainty can open up opportunities for people in a more emancipatory, positive vision that I've been trying to argue for, and hopefully not romanticizing, but it equally can close down. I mean, you know, look how authoritarian populists around the world have used uncertainties um, you know, whether around know, vaccination or whether around um, migration flows or, you know, what do authoritarian populists around the world use to generate a reaction that draws them into a regressive authoritarian modality for politics? Well, often it is, a, 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 you know, a ret rhetoric about uncertainty. What populism can do is provide uncertainty, pr provide certainty. Look at the debate about uh, Brexit in this country. You know, people were fearful of the uncertainties that exist around around migration, around uh, around you know a globalized economy. They wanted certainty. You know. Boris sat in front of that bus offering certainty. X, X amount of money was going to come into the, the country because of X, Y, and Z. Well, of course, it didn't happen. He was lying. Of course he was. But he used the idea of people's fear of uncertainty and the anxieties and fear that, uh, that, uh, that was associated with it, along with his allies on the fur further right, to create a vision of certainty. And people voted for Brexit for that reason. And we've seen that, see, I mean, I've given a UK example, but you could look, look at that in Brazil, you could look at that in Turkey, you could look at that in India, you could look at that in Hungary or many other countries around the world. So yes, absolutely, uncertainty can also become a weapon for the powerful to deepen authoritarian um, rule and in the process, deepen the precarity of those most vulnerable, which, of course, is what's happened through Brexit. OK, thanks. Um, OK, now we'll come back to this question, which I was saving because um, I think it's actually a really great question. And I, and I imagine there may be quite a few online right now who will be interested in this one and the answer. So what advice can you give a scholar with a more critical interdisciplinary perspective who's working in a group with a more conventional engineering for development approach. Maybe one thing would be to print out your, uh, your matrix and stick it in a very prominent place, yeah. to be alerting people to it. So, what would you advise? Well, I mean, this is, we, we ran a, a summer school with the Step Center for nine years, I think. Um, and this was in a way the, the running debate through you know, 40 people each year who came to the Step Summer School, um, sadly no longer happening, 
with this critical interdisciplinary perspective attracted to what we were doing in the step summer school but often working in not necessarily engineering but also you know basically people who who existed in the top left hand corner of my diagram uh, or at least this is andy's diagram um i think there's a you know really important conversation to be had and uh it's about how uncertainties are dealt with in modeling, in risk assessment, in the way questions are framed, in how engineering approaches are, um, are designed. And I'm not saying that risk approaches are irrelevant in all contexts. I mean, I made the case that, you know, road building is a case where actually we know what happens to, you know, materials when you put them on a road and we know what the likelihood of you know them them uh, failing or not happens we're, we're we're grateful for engineers who build our houses bridges and airplanes and so on to have that knowledge about the uh, you know predictive calculable knowledge about risks so i'm not dissing every area of um of uh, of risk analysis or conventional engineering approaches. These have massively important and remain important approaches, but most settings where we work in development don't match those contexts. And that's why we do need this more critical interdisciplinary perspective that does embrace uncertainty. Um, and this does mean a much more focused discussion about how models are constructed, how questions are framed, and how risk assessment uh, is deployed. And I think this can be a very productive and open question because most scientists will immediately agree. I mean, I was trained as a, a natural scientist in biology, um, will immediately degree, uh, agree that uncertainty, just as Richard Feynman said, you know, Nobel Prize winning physicist, uncertainty is central to the, to the conduct of science. Good science has to challenge and think about uncertainty all the time so that would be the conversation that i would start with you know first principle science um before we get to you know is my risk assessment approach better than yours because that then gets slightly irrelevant because actually the premises are what you need to have the debate about but i think you know increasingly uh, those working in applied settings are realizing that the, the practices that, that existed in the past, the institutions, the policies, the broader frameworks within which people operate, just don't work. They may work to build a road, but they're not working in the day-to-day -day settings that we're, we're all engaged with. So I think that mismatch is where to start this conversation and not come in with a critical um perspective in the, i mean it is critical in that in that positive sense but not in a sort of negative critical sense but say look yeah let's discuss you know which area of of andy's two by two matrix are we in are we talking about ambiguity are we debating outcomes are we talking about uncertainty we, where we don't know the likelihood very often or actually are we talking about ignorance where we know, neither know the outcomes nor the likelihood of those outcomes and this you will find in engineering for development or any agricultural development or health for development this will be you know the nine out of ten situation where we'll find ourselves and then the argument is as i've tried to make in the talk well what do we do about this you know how do we move ahead what type of skills do we need for what i've called reliability professionals drawing on emory Rowe and others work um what skills do we need? It's not just 101 engineering or 101 economics or 101 agronomy. We need more than that. And that's what we, we, we talked about in our summer schools. What's the additional things? Yeah, we've got good training in, in engineering. We've got good training in, in economics. We've got good training in health science. But what else do we need? Well, we need these other softer skills which are not often recognized they're skills that pastoralists have they're skills that control room operators have to have by necessity but are often not recognized but we we, we need to surface them 
what are they it would be a new it would be a very interesting curriculum design exercise i'm looking at peter here because this is his professional area you know what would they be how would you teach them how, how would you build those capacities in a a new generation of development professionals i don't think we're doing it in standard training in development studies frankly uh, even at ids dare i say it yeah yeah and i i would i would say too that um many formal education systems given that they're they're basically designed on principles of certainty which you mm. satisfy by passing exams and um you know ticking many many boxes of different kinds are inherently probably not well designed to prepare people for this way of of, of viewing the world so perhaps what part of that is about engagement with people who live with uncertainty and let those principles sort of govern their lives and existence and to learn from them much more proactively but as you said earlier how do we create spaces where people can come together in that way and uh, and learn together and that's uh, you know that that is a challenge um, for for sure we're we're moving towards this, the sort of the end of the the time but still a few minutes left but we do have another question which is uh, I guess it's a, it's perhaps a more philosophical question. It might be one which sort of brings us towards the end. Development is a part of the wider capitalist project and exposed to its inherent uncertainties is autarky to be preferred. So, you know, can we become a, a much more sort of self-sufficient um, kind of community where we, we basically learn to operate in a completely different way? Well, yeah, uh, again, is how you define autarky. But um, uh, I think, I mean, it's a very good point that, you know, the uncertainties that we face are co-constituted with contemporary forms of capitalism, uh, whether that's, you know, the liberalized supply systems and the consequences of gas supply in the UK, whether that's, um, you know, migration that we've talked about, whether that's expropriation of land that was mentioned before in pastoral regions, or whether that's the, you know, the way that the financial system um, collapsed. But uh, so each of those are, are instances where, you know, the co-constituted relations of capitalism and patterns of accumulation that have happened within capitalism have created particular forms of uncertainty that we are um, facing. And of course, climate change is a, a, is a prime example. Climate change isn't just a physical feature, it's co-constituted with capitalism. This is fairly, should be fairly obvious to all the, everyone in this audience. So yeah, we can think about, well, how do we remove ourselves from capitalism? Do uncertainties then disappear? Well, I think the, the Soviet Union is a fairly good example of where uh, this isn't the case. I mean, you can create a socialist state, you try and create certainty through planning and so on, but it, you know, again, unravels. And, you know, one of the interesting things about the Chinese state is that it accepts um, levels of uncertainty and embraces the levels of uncertainty in its nature of, of planning and, and acceptance of hybridity and, and all the rest of it. Um, in uh, you know, in, in that accommodation between capitalism and socialism and forms of uncertainty that are developed from both systems. So I don't think the, the solution is necessarily a radical transformation of the system, but it's correctly, um, we have to understand where uncertainties come from within contemporary capitalism. I and mean, that is a imp very important intellectual project, which should be the center of you know, development studies questions, because all of these, th these uncertainties we've been talking about, as I've said, are the product of a particular capitalist relationships. Whether the solution is, is I mean, I've suggested the solution isn't, isn't a sort of socialist nirvana of, of you know, state control, because I think that um, that is quickly undermined as we've seen historically. But nor is it necessarily just retreating to communalism, because uh, you know uncertainties exist there. Um, you know, it, it, it's. I think Alex's question earlier on, you know, or Dina's comment on on avoiding romanticizing. You know, pastoralists don't exist 
and manage uncertainty separately from the rest of the world. They might have done 150 years ago, but even then they were connected to trading systems and city states and so on. Um, it's not as if uh, you know autarkic, uh, you know communalist type alternatives are the solution either. So I don't have an answer to the uh, question, but I don't think uh, I think you know we have to think about how uncertainties are co-constituted with um, political formations and capitalism in particular, which is the dominant um, uh, dominant form of economic and political relations globally. Um, in in new and different ways, and you know that does suggest by taking uncertainty seriously in development, which is what I've argued, uh, that does making make taking those relationships seriously too. Great. So Ian, just to sort of take us up to close, um, this is the first lecture in the Sussex Development Lecture Series for this year. We're going to have more coming, um, hosted by IDS, by School of Global Studies, Centre for International Education and SPRU. Um, given they're all coming under this theme of development in an uncertain world, what would you, what would you hope could be questions from your perspective? that you'd like others to be thinking about as they're preparing for their sessions? What are the things you want to put on the table which you feel that this series could help us to grapple with as we go, as we go forward? Oh my goodness, that's a difficult one and unfair. Thank you, Peter. Um, okay, so I, I mean, I, at the sort of broader level, just picking up on the, the, my answer to the last question, I think a, a wider discussion about how sort of macro, economic and political processes and within capitalism are co-constituted with uncertainty and the implications of that for for development i think would be a very interesting strand of argument as applied to climate change or whatever i think there's a set of questions and in the chat lydia has asked an interesting question about methodology is is how do we grapple with this you know, we always talk about complexity and uncertainty and contingency. Um, uh, Lydia asks the question, can we learn from the past in order to think about the future? Can we relate the, uh, relate, you know, across sectors, north, south, about how uncertainties are constituted? I think there's a whole set of methodological questions about how Grappling with mess, methodological incertitude, if you like, um, suggests a very different methodological frame to what we're used to, which is, you know, ask the question, get the answer, find the solution. You know, that sort of linear version of methodolo methodology. I think we have to open up development methodology much more. And it's not just, you know, quantitative versus participatory those type of axes is actually how do we open up to see and understand uncertainties more effectively and it can be through a variety of different methodological routes which is something that Andy Sterling again has talked about a lot um, and is uh, central to the work of the step center um, and then the final question final set of themes I think it would be much more practical what our discussion of what we we talked about before um, what would be the skills, aptitudes, capabilities that uncertainty professionals working in development or reliability professionals working with uncertainty in development, I should say, what should they have? And what should, what unlearning, you know, in de-schooling, de-schooling society, if you like, from Ivan Illich, how, how do we unlearn in order to relearn for this new world? or at least to confront the disconnect that I started with and uh, highlighted in response to James's question earlier. And what would, what would development studies look like differently? What would have to be, you know, if we're churning out <laughs> master's graduates from IDS or wherever, what would their five top capabilities be? Um, and would they be different to what they get now? <laughs> 
And I think this is uh, an important question for you know, postgraduate education, but it's just as important a question for, and I hope our, our colleagues in the School of Education uh, are thinking about it, and I know they are, uh, this would be just as an important question in, in primary or secondary education. Because as you mentioned, Peter, um, most of our schooling from when we start in this country from the age of five is about creating a narrow schooled version of the world. And we're often, we're, we're not good at dealing with uncertainty. And our capacities to deal with a pandemic, to deal with climate change, often result in fear and worry and anxiety, rather than a positive vision, collective, caring, convivial vision, which is what we need to deal with these major challenges, which are not going to go away. Brilliant. Ian, thanks. And yeah, it was an unfair question, but at the same time, you gave great answers. And I think that's really stimulating. <laughs> input I think for others to be thinking about as we go forward I particularly like the the question about what does that mean for for learning you know for those who are engaging in development and what may need to change and, and any talk that includes Ivan Illich is is excellent in, uh, in my book but that's for sure um, thank you so much it's been a really fascinating discussion a great presentation many thanks for responding to so many very good questions from very good questions yeah the, uh, thank you participants uh, both on um, on zoom and on youtube um, it has been recorded so it will be available for others to hear the next Sussex development lecture will be on the 28th of october with someone i know and uh, i know it will be a good session professor alejandra boni Deputy Director of Ingenio Politecnico de Valencia in Spain. And she'll be speaking on navigating uncertainty with epistemic justice, reflections for higher education institutions. So perhaps she'll pick up um, some of those points that you just raised, Ian. I hope everybody will tune in and listen. Um, normally at this stage, we'd you know, gather in the IDS bar and have a convivial gathering. Um, we're still online right now. Later in the year, we'll be moving into more hybrid modes. But Ian, thanks so much for, uh, for doing this virtually. I think your energy and passion for this really came through very, very strongly and uh, very, very much appreciated. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Bye for now. Bye. Right, I'm going to go. See yes. you, Peter. See you, Ian. Hopefully in 3D the next time. That, that would be great, with, <laughs> okay. something, with something in hand. Well, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> we'll okay, that. cheers. That's I'm great. off. Thanks so much. Right, bye-bye. Bye. Thanks to colleagues for organising as well. Well done. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. bye. Bye. bye.